Wait, what? No, wait, wait. Are they even vulnerable for like a single moment? That's crazy. They're just invulnerable forever. Invulnerable face. Never ending. That's the secret. <laughs> just be a boss with endless invul face. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I think it's a good concept. Invul phases. Yeah, I think that might be something I would want to use in my game. I would need to be able to accurately tell the player though. And the problem is right now there's zero feedback for enemies, so they don't have a health bar. There's no damage numbers, there's no particles, there's just nothing to tell you what's going on with enemies. Yeah, so I need to come up with some feedback methods. I mean, ideally like a bunch of feedback methods to really just hammer at home. Like there's health bars, there's damage numbers, there's particles, there's sounds. Um, maybe the enemy recoils after taking damage, like there's gotta be- oh, speed, nice. There's gotta be all sorts of stuff to really hammer at home, I think. Because I think that's the problem with, um, like making- I don't know necessarily all indie games. Indie games in my context, where it's like, you know, people will give them not even five minutes of attention. I mean, they'll give them 20 seconds of attention before getting bored. Or like, you know, they can only care for 20 seconds and then they're like, alright, this is dumb, I'm moving on. You really need to make things, like, happen, because it's not enough time to learn the game, right? 20 seconds, you're not gonna learn- I mean, maybe not 20 seconds. One minute, probably. 40 seconds, like, it's, you know... It's not a long time. So you don't have long to learn the mechanics, so you really need to hammer home what you can, and make it just incredibly obvious. I think that's the best... game design, like, tip, like, overall, like, new player onboarding tip... that I've learned, like, that I've heard, like, ever is, you know, if you want a player to know something, it needs to be- or if you want a player to figure out something, that's the thing. It needs to be incredibly obvious. Like, if there is any point where you can make it more obvious, do. Like, it needs to be, like, like nothing to figure out, essentially. Like, any mystery, any puzzle, take it all out, just make it, like, as easy as possible to execute, whatever you're thinking about and as obvious as you can to figure out. Like, you have to stumble upon it by doing nothing, essentially. And that way, if you're lucky, players will actually interact with your mechanic that you want them to use. Because <laughs> otherwise, they just don't notice. And like, I'm, I'm breaking my own advice. It's hard advice to follow. Actually, I don't know if I've even heard that from anybody. Maybe it's just something I came up with or, you know, whatever, failed over and over again. So I found out the hard way. But like, I still don't follow my own advice, so like, for the current game, there's like a ult, ultimate ability that you have when you hold left and right down for a few seconds, because I wanted to add, you know, it's a local multiplayer game, the only controls you have are the arrow keys, or WSD, whichever one you're using. And so, um, there's not very much skill expression other than moving, like it's auto-shoot, right? Some of them you can do like the direction, but it's really, there's not much skill expression. And so, um, and it's not a good mechanic because nobody knows how to use it. Even if you tell them, it's hard to explain. You can't just like in one moment say like, oh, you have to hold the left and right arrow keys for 2.5 seconds or whatever, you know. It's like a hard thing to... And of course the lack of feedback is incredibly harmful. So yeah, that mechanic might have to go or just become easier somehow. The problem is like to control stuff, like it's... You know... You want control. Yeah, you really, it's like a fine balance of like, you know, getting fine, minute control for like late game players who know how to play the game. Which like yourself is one of those when you're developing a game. You know, you are essentially a late game player with how much you're testing it out and learning every mechanic inside and out to test it essentially. Test it for bugs and to test it for like funness, test it for everything, you know. Um, you, just, you just end up doing a lot of the game thing. I don't know how much it really matters, like, again. <laughs> I don't know, I'll see, I'll see how Neko Quest goes, if anybody, if there's any actual interest in that. Because if people actually wanted to, uh, yeah, if, like, anybody actually played it, like, that would be a fun thing to build on, a fun concept to improve and, um, extend. Yeah, so I'll see. I don't know, I still need to <laughs> do the world generation, it's gonna be such a pain. I should just put my head down and just finish that one aspect, because everything else is going to be so easy after that. I mean, it's just the same as stuff I've already done, just again, you know? Dungeon generation, I can do. Enemies, I can do, you know? Bosses are going to be something to figure out, that's for sure. I think I have a cool plan for the um, bosses the way I want to do, so in case you're out of the loop, NecroQuest is a text-based, like, adventure game. I don't know if adventure game is the right term. Not like typing text, but like, you know, it's rendered in text, and it's like turn-based. 
So like you enemies only move when you move type deal. It's really like roguelike definition. It's like all the points, you know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my idea for the uh, bosses in Neko Quest is uh, I want to have like you know like keys. It, like essentially have them be a locked door, right? And what I mean by that is that there's a key to the door. So there will be a certain boss that maybe they like, you know, it's a snake enemy, a snake boss like we're in right now. And the snake boss has an effect that when it damages you, it has a chance to apply poison. And poison will reduce your health by half every time, let's say. A debilitating effect. It'll just compound and like take your HP down. Unless you have the anti-poison ring. That's a boring synergy, but... I mean, you get my point, right? Or maybe there is a uh, anti-venom you can consume before the fight that will prevent poison from affecting you. Like, it prevents you from uptaking poison. Or maybe there's another item where that it redirects the poison back at the boss. You know, the... Uh, like, I don't even know what that would be. Depends how it applies the poison in the first place, I guess. But yeah, anyway, so I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, there's a key to defeat the boss, and maybe, so, you know, the way to get the key, it would be a deal of, you know, it's like you're walking around the world, you f stumble upon a village. Villagers are like, oh gosh, we've been tormented by this boss and their minions all this, like, so long. Nobody can defeat them. Nobody can defeat the boss. Because nobody, you know, the boss deals poison, and that's why we have so many sick and injured here, so maybe that leads into a quest, right? And... You know, maybe at the end of the quest, you know, the person says, Oh, if only we had, you know, the anti-venom ring of, of whatever, some boss's name, in a different dungeon. So that leads you on a quest to go there. To go get the anti-poison ring from the loot, from like the chest from that other boss. And then you can defeat the, uh, the first one you're, you're even trying to do. So it like, you know, things lead into each other. Uh, is, is sort of my thought process there. I shouldn't kite these out into the poison water when you're confused and trying to dodge. It's one of the worst experiences ever. That could be a cool boss mechanic. Like a similar, like a confused mechanic. And like maybe there's a thing like instead of an anti-confusion ring, you have a confusion ring, you know, like you're always confused. So you get used to the confusion controls, so that way when the boss confuses you, it doesn't like disorient you. It's just you're already used to it, so you don't have to really, like, think any extra, like, steps. It's just already what you're doing. And so in a sense, you're like, you know, you still have to interact with the mechanic, but it's in a way that you can still prov you can still sort of get resistance to it without just, you know, turn off the boss's mechanic to make it easier. And I guess a classic example, like, you know, the classic example is, like, blunt weapons are extra effective against skeletons, like, or undead, maybe. Something like that. Maybe there's a boss, it's just a giant skeleton. And it attacks every turn, uh, stunning you, meaning it just stun locks you. Unless you have, uh, you know, it could be like right, the blunt weapon that just uh, like knocks down the boss. And so it only attacks every other turn, giving you a chance even between the stumbling to actually attack it. Yeah, or maybe you have something like a spiked shield or spiked armor, right? Such that when an enemy attacks you, it stumbles them if they're using physical attacks. So you would force a boss like, you know, the skeleton boss, which may be strong with physical attacks, you would force to use magic attacks, which it would be very weak with. But if it didn't want to stumble, that's what it would do. And of course the AI would, would contribute to sort of helping that happen. And maybe you could even combine effects. So like, you know, you could combine that with a throwable potion that reduces the enemy's mana. So they could really just like, they, you know, they would be screwed, you know, you could, by combining these effects. Stuff like that, random, random Neko Quest thoughts. Yeah, when I talk about ideas, I feel like it's more just like, not even brainstorming. I mean, it is brainstorming, but like, it's not like I necessarily want these ideas in the game. Yeah, the reason why I do this, like, uh, like brainstorming is that, you know, for my own games, right? So in the future, I'll have all these ideas stored up. I'll probably forget them. If I write them down, I'll have them stored up. But, and, because, like, every once in a while, right, you'll come up with something and you're like, oh, like, you know what would be cool? For this game is that idea that I thought of once. 
And that's, I think, a useful tool even with your own games, you know? I think a lot of people fall into the trap, myself included, of just adding everything you want to your game without really deeply considering whether or not it's a good addition and whether it actually adds to, you know, your core game loop. And of course it depends on what kind of game you're making, because some games, I think, benefit from just having a bunch of systems and not really... I mean, they can be tied together, but they're not... Uh, what do you call that? Intimately tied together. They are, you know, just there, and interacting with a variety of systems at a time is the fun activity of the game. But, like, sometimes when you're making a game, right, it's, you know, it's hard to know when when to say no, right? You think of a cool feature, and it just it doesn't fit with your game, so you try to shoehorn it in, and it makes your game worse for it. Sometimes. I'm not saying always, I'm not even saying usually, but there are times where that is the case. And so, yeah, you can do from your own games, even, you can say, all right. We'll put that one on the back burner, write it down in a, in a design document. So in the future, when we're making a new game, you can, and you're looking for features maybe, you scan through your documents, see what would fit here. And so you just have a bunch of um, puzzle pieces ready to be put together. You just have to draw one out of the pile. You have all your building blocks. They may be different colors, shapes, and sizes, but eventually you're gonna be making something and you're gonna have that one block that's the, the keystone that you need. That's the perfect thing to put in that place. Yeah, I feel like I get this advice. I get it mostly from people who, you know, don't know anything, or at least, you know, like don't know as much about game devs as I assume I do. I mean, I've released, you know, dozens of games, right? So I feel like I know more than somebody that's released none. I know it's like appeal to something or another. Just like at a fundamental level, you know, I feel like I somewhat know what I'm talking about. So when, you know, and I explain my thought process too, right? So like I explain why I think these things, and it gives you room to say, oh, that's a good point, but here's what I, how I consider it differently, and here's why. So, you know, there's, you can dissect the points individually instead of just having one, you know, huge statement. Because I have people tell me, you know, they'll be like, yeah, you just need to make a small scope, small scale project, you know, that's all you need to do. You know, ignoring the fact that I've made pretty much most of my games are that way, like it's just, I've made so many that are just tiny, small scale, not that that's bad. I think it's good to be, again, it's a, it's a focused design. But, you know, people will just regurgitate this advice because they heard it somewhere, and it's not bad advice. Maybe not even for most people, or maybe not for... What, what am I trying to say here? The advice may not be for everybody, but it probably works well for most people. That's what I'm trying to say. And so, you know, it's, it's good advice, but, like, they don't understand why the advice is given. The reason the advice is given is because many people have what I like to call designer brain. Uh, and designer brain, in my, uh, like, argument, my estimate, is where, you know, you can come up with concepts, designs, you think of what... Again, yeah, the design is what it sounds like. Instead of the doing. OMG, I have designer brain. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people have designer brain. Yeah, so the reason the advice of make a small focused project is good for many people is because many people have designer brain. You know the, the um, saying, like, everybody has ideas, but, you know, like, so, you know, as a result, your ideas aren't valuable. I don't think it's a saying, actually, now that I think about it. But that's the concept, you know, everybody has ideas, nobody actually wants to do the doing behind those ideas. Or even, you know, the thought work of thinking deeper of those ideas, so like, you know, like, I want to have a shovel in our game that can move dirt blocks. All right, what does that mean for the enemies? How does the design, how does that affect our design for the boss uh, levels, you know? Uh, like, people just want to think of cool stuff, not how the cool stuff affects your worlds. And on the other, that as well as they don't want to think about, or they don't want to, like, implement is the other thing. Whereas me, I don't come up with, ideas don't come to me very easily. You know, my point is that um, the advice of making small projects, make a small focused game project that's really tiny, small in scope, small in scale, to get it finished, you know, is good for most people because they are designer brain, and they just come up, if, you know, they don't do that, They'll come up with a million, ooh, a million ideas and never um, finish any of them and never tie any of them together. So you end up with an unfocused blobby mess of a game. And the same can apply to anything. Art, um, probably writing also. Like many things it can also uh, apply to. And so that's why it's good advice for many people. But I don't have this problem, I don't think. Like, I am. it's very easy for me to control myself and say no to an idea. 
Of course, looking at Neko Crest, it is probably an exception because I'm adding features like fishing and I'm adding features like teaming, all these things, but it's, it's almost a test of a new style of design because it's a sort of game where you have a million different sort of mechanics that are, I don't want to say completely unrelated, but, uh, you know, they're not directly tied into each other. You know, when you throw a torch, it doesn't light the ground on fire type, type mechanic, which doesn't light the enemies on fire. As an aside, I do want to be able to do that in Echo Quest to light things on fire. But regardless of that, like the fishing minigame has no impact whatsoever, no synergy, no nothing with the taming minigame. Actually, that's a lie because you can just use the fish to tame, to tame fish monsters. But you get what I mean, like it's a superficial, it's, the synergy is not with the taming minigame, the, the synergy is with the inventory system. The inventory system also has a synergy with the taming mechanic, that is the, the synergy layout. They're not tied to each other, they're just, they're, they're indirectly, like they're both tied to the inventory system, so that's why they seem related. But they're completely separate, right? Hopefully that made some sense. Anyway, I just like to complain when people give me advice, because the problem is they don't understand why the advice, like I just right now explained why the advice is that way, and why it doesn't work for me. But they don't know that. They just say the advice because they heard it somewhere, and they thought it sounded cool, and so or good, or useful, or whatever. And so they tell it to me, you know, afterwards. And I understand the advice, I understand why I should regard it, and why I should disregard it. I understand both points of, of view. For me, because I can sort of, uh, like, analyze it. But... Anyway, yeah. And I'm sure I'm guilty of this as well in, in fields that I'm not super familiar with. Like, if I try to give advice about art, probably don't listen to me because I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, that's the problem with balancing items, like... If you make one slightly better than the rest, everybody's gonna use that one, always, you know? At like the you know top tier of play or whatever. Like that's what happened to the dagger that was better than Cedar. Uh, that like what was it emerald something dagger? The one from Skulls. The uh, the one from uh, not Manor. The Sam one from Sam was like just straight up better. It had more range and more DPS. There were like no downsides I think for a really long time, and just everybody used it over, like, better, not better daggers, but the old best daggers. And even, like, it was better than, like, Sea Dirk, I think, also, which is, like, there was, like, no downsides. It was straight up better in every way. And so everybody used it, and it feels like it just removes the choice from the player. Like, right now, I choose the piercing weapon if I want to pierce, but it does less damage and has less range, so I don't always use it. Same with the teleport cloak. If there's a time I need to teleport, which, admittedly, recently is looking rare, pretty rare, but... I have it such that for that purpose, but I use the regular one at other times. And it also gives you the choice because, you know, maybe the teleport and extra mana cost is not that much of a downside if um, you want to preserve your inventory space. So, like, there's always, like, trade-offs between all these things. So, so when you make one the objective best, it just... It, it removes player choice, in a sense, I feel like. And, like, people say, and, like, this is true, like, when you look up, like, the build guide and, like, the best way to play or, like, you know, the most efficient way to do things, it, like, ruins the fun of the game. But I think the reason why is due to the core game design. I don't think learning about a game should re reduce your having fun of it. It should make it more fun. Slay the Spire is the most fun. It, it will be the most fun, I guess. When you get Ascension 20. When you've learned all the mechanics and now you're just, you're doing the hardest mode. You're forced to interact with every single mechanic in the game at the highest level possible that you can. Um, I think that would be, you know, the most fun. I haven't gotten there yet, obviously, but, you know, Ascension Zero is not very fun because you can just do whatever, for me at least. I, the, the restriction is what makes it interesting.